Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. April 15th, 2013, just before 3 p.m. It is the Boston Marathon. Two explosions, 13 seconds apart, rip through crowds of people and send the entire city and the nation into a frenzy. 282 are injured, three people killed, including an eight-year-old boy. At least 14 of the injured have limbs severed. The street is literally stained with blood. You've seen the pictures. The city is locked down. The FAA restricts airspace. Doctors and emergency workers describe a scene that looks like a war zone. An MIT police officer is soon executed at gunpoint by the bombers, brothers, one of whom is fatally injured in a gunfight with police, the other found taken into custody. Their actions leave behind devastated individuals and families mourning the dead. Some of the survivors facing the unthinkable reality that even if they walk again, it will be with prosthetics. The media and the public ask questions, they present theories, they demand answers, they try to make sense of it all. The landscape of our society changes again as we slip ever deeper into the era of uncertainty, the era of instant and unsuspected calamity, the era of the suspicious backpack, the unattended package, the security camera. The anonymous face in the crowd, the potential that joy can turn to terror at any moment to anybody without warning. We look in the mirror, we wonder if we'll ever be standing in the wrong place at the wrong time when the bomb goes off. When the car slides out of the lane and off of the highway. When the structure collapses, when the floodwaters come, when disaster, both natural and human-made, comes knocking on our door. We think of the fragility of life. We think about our kids. We think of our parents, our brothers, our sisters, our cherished friends, the precious people who are so deeply woven into the fabric of our lives. Will we ever lose them? Will we ever mourn them? Could we ever save them? How could we get through life without them? Only two days later in the town of West Texas, an explosion shakes the earth and takes with it the lives of at least 14, 160 injured, around 60 still missing. 150 buildings are damaged or destroyed outright. News reports fly about the tons of dangerous chemicals stored at the fertilizer plant that exploded. What were the safety protocols? How long has it been since the last inspection? Was it neglect? Was it a freak accident? Who's responsible? What's responsible? How could this happen? Buried under the smoke and the media hysteria, under the shock and speculation, are the shattered families of the dead who must somehow get out of bed and get through the day. Whole parts of their hearts have literally been amputated, just stripped away. They have been cheated out of the opportunity to rescue, to warn, to say any last words, to create any final memories beyond this violent end. The ache is just so dense as to make it difficult to stand up under the weight. 
on the television is the report of a man named Joe Berti, who, against the odds, was present at and survived both explosions. He ran the Boston Marathon. He crossed the finish line only seconds before the first bomb went off. His wife was taking photographs near the finish line. They left without injury. Two days later, he was traveling home on I-35 in proximity to the fertilizer plant when it exploded. The headlines say, Man Miraculously Survives. Now, those of us looking through the broader, wider lens ask why God would direct his miracle toward this man instead of placing a divine and impenetrable shield around an eight-year-old boy. Or for that matter, any of those whose bodies were shredded in these terrible events. Yesterday at 2.50, bells tolled across Boston and Massachusetts in memory of the tragedy, in memory of the lost, in memory of the wounded. This past Sunday, Reverend Samuel T. Lloyd III of Boston's Trinity Episcopal Church said this, quote, So where is God when the terrorists do their work? God is there, holding us and sustaining us. God is in the pain the victims are suffering and the healing that will go on. God is with us as we try still to build a just world, a world where there will not be terrorists doing their terrible damage, unquote. God is sustaining us. These lofty words are understandable. They're designed to comfort, to heal, to assure, to help. I mean, on the surface, we can see how desperate human beings can so desperately anchor themselves to the idea of a great protector that cures all ills and heals all pain and gives all mercy and reunites all who fall into his embrace. Right? God and heaven and eternal bliss, they're the happy ending that humankind has handwritten to the most tragic of stories, but to this community, the atheist community. These explanations and encouragements are just not satisfying. We don't hold to a God that would allow calamity to exist merely so that he could be the hero that rescues us from it. We don't hold to a God that allows us to be poisoned so that he could provide the antidote. We don't hold to a God that remains uninvolved, invisible, unprovable, undetectable, uninterested in reaching down and plucking a child away from a backpack filled with deadly explosives. We take no comfort in stories of an afterlife, a reunion in the sky, a greater good. We have chosen in the best and worst of days to live in and embrace the real world. And when we mourn, we don't hold our eyes and hands up toward the heavens. We hold them toward each other. Because in this unpredictable and often insane world, we are still convinced that the greatest forces for lifting up a fallen and grieving heart are a compassionate word, a generous gesture, a loving heart, and a human hand. On February the 19th of 2011, we aired what is, I believe, our most popular radio podcast called Grief Without God. Even if the numbers aren't the highest among all of the shows we've done, this is the one I hear about the most. They send emails. They come up to me at our live events as we're out at conventions or tour stops or whatever, and they bring this show up. I was going through a very difficult, horrifying time. I didn't know how I was going to get by. I wasn't sure how a non-believer in God is supposed to cope. I had come out of religion and now that I look at religion from the other side and watch the funeral services and listen to the platitudes that people toss at each other so flippantly, 
it did nothing for me. It gave me nothing. It gave me no tools to be able to get past what was going on. And then I heard this show. If you haven't heard the podcast, I would encourage you to just take a look at it. You can find it on Blog Talk Radio. You can find it on my YouTube page called Grief Without God. Air date was in February, February 19th, 2011. And this show is probably a continuation of that discussion. Because death and loss and grief and recovering from tragedy and rebuilding our lives deity free is a common experience in this community. I mean, death affects us all. We all know someone who was taken too early, or maybe they lived a long life and it still hurts. We think about them and we get that ache in our chest and we, we, we have fond memories, but painful memories. We, we deal with the unthinkable and, and think, if I don't believe we will one day be reunited in the heavens, if I don't believe that God is in control, if, it's, if every person is just out here and it's all just a free-for-all, how do I get past all of this? Well, this show is named for an organization founded by a young lady named Rebecca Hensler. Her infant son died in 2009, and she received the typical religious condolences. Finally found them unsatisfying, and she founded an organization called Grief Beyond Belief, and I borrowed the name of the organization for this show, and she joins me on the air now. Rebecca Hensler, thank you so much for being here. Hi, thank you for having me. Talk to me, if you would, about the events that led up to the founding of Grief Beyond Belief, as much as you're comfortable talking about it, okay? Absolutely. I, the beginning of the story of Grief Beyond Belief has to be my son. Um, I had a baby boy um, almost exactly four years ago, and he was born with a very severe birth defect, and he was given one in ten odds by the doctors to live. Um, but my wife and I very much wanted him and wanted to give him a chance. And so he was born and he was very sick and he needed surgery within the first week of his life. Um, we had known that he was going to be born with this severe birth defect uh, called uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And he other than the fact that he had to be intubated within the first minute of his life and he was always, you know, his life was entirely spent with tubes and, and wires coming off of him in the infant ICU. Um, he was a beautiful boy. He was smart and curious and funny and affectionate. And we had you know, thanks to the doctors, we had 90 very beautiful days with him, and he died in my arms at the age of 90 days. And um, obviously, I was overwhelmed with grief. Well, first, I was in that sort of disbelieving shock that one is in, and then, you know, as the months passed by, I felt myself sort of reaching out for grief support and discovered online grief support and then really within only a couple months had discovered that online grief support, as great as it was, the it was very alienating. Um, there was so much religious content, so much spiritual content. If it wasn't your baby's in heaven, it was your baby's spirit is all around you and he's sending you signs to tell you he loves you, you know, and every butterfly you see and blah, blah, blah. And um, it really didn't work for me. And I... I appreciated the intent of the comfort I was being offered, but I think like a lot of people, um, it felt like other people's were, beliefs were being projected onto my own grief. And so I started thinking, 
about the idea of online grief support that was specifically for people who did not believe in God and did not believe in any kind of afterlife. Um, and a bunch of things happened. I really think that, you know, there were some odds that I would have just sort of thought, oh, that would be a good idea, and then gone on with life. Um, but I happened to talk about this idea to Greta Christina, who happens to be a very old friend of mine. And she really, I have to say, pushed, I would say, really encouraged me and told me how much how much it would mean to the community and that the idea of grief support for non-believers was already under discussion. It just sort of hadn't happened yet. Um, and she also sent me all these links and told me all these places to go to read about what other people were saying about it. And eventually, one of the things I found was the show you had done that you were just talking about, of course. And um, I think that in many ways that helped really um, solidify my resolve because it was so clear from that show that there was such a profound need for grief support for people who were non-believers. Um, the other thing that happened was I, through the um, online grief support organization I was participating in, I met Cliff Schrager, who I know is a listener of yours, and he really, his story and his experience of being uh, grieving as a non-believer surrounded by religious people made it very clear to me that there was specifically a need for people who were really isolated in their atheism to get support through the internet because they didn't have anyone in their day-to-day -day life who they could talk about, um, not just that they were grieving, but the way that they were grieving. And so sort of over the course of a couple of years, I, I brought myself to the point where I was ready to start the organization, and I found it in the summer of um, 2011, and it took off very quickly. Um, I think the Facebook page got something like a 1,000 likes in the first eight days, and um, we're now at you know, 7,000 people um, who have liked the page and, you know, just hundreds of people who interact with the Great Beyond Belief Network on a regular basis. I saw the article in USA Today from February 17th of last year called Grief mm -hmm. Without God is a Challenge for mm -hmm. Non-Believers. Did USA Today contact you out of the blue or had you guys been sort of trying to promote what you were about? How did that interview take place? Actually, it's a great story because it shows how the atheist community is really um, functioning to provide all kinds of support. Um, I had been asked to speak at East Bay Atheists in Berkeley, and I had um, given a talk, just told the story of Grief Beyond Belief, why I started it and what we were doing and what we were planning on doing. And um, I got a phone call from a woman who was working for Religion News Service um, and particularly working the atheist beat, essentially, for Religion News Service. And she said, I want to interview you. I'm not sure where this story will be published because this is a wire service, but USA Today often picks up my stories. Um, but the important thing here is that the funding for her position specifically covering atheist issues was coming through um, Todd Stiefel, Stiefel's organization, um, which funds atheist causes. Um, and so really it was, here's this um, atheist philanthropist, he gives money to a someone who's a reporter to report stories about atheism, and that gave me the ability, her writing that story and it being published in USA Today and Huffington Post and Washington Post, gave me the ability to get out the word about Grief Beyond Belief to this extraordinary um, not just a large number of people, but a much broader audience, because the initial 
um, people who joined Grief Beyond Belief had heard about it through atheist bloggers. And I think it's really important for people to recognize and people in the community to recognize that they're both atheists who consider themselves part of the atheist community and read atheist blogs and go to atheist conferences. But there's also this sort of astounding number of people out there who just don't believe and they are not part of a community, and maybe they read things like the Huffington Post and uh, USA Today instead of free thought blogs, and they're not going to get that information unless we get it out through the mainstream media. And so it's just amazing because all of a sudden there were, you know, the numbers doubled, and we were reaching a whole new audience, of people who really needed the support. Talking here with Rebecca Hensler, the founder of Grief Beyond Belief. Every day you must navigate the stories of the heartbroken, right? They probably lean on you and your community to a great extent in the moment of incredible need. You're seeing an incredible amount of transparency. People are sort of at at their wits end, right? Emotionally and physically, mm -hmm. they're just exhausted and they sort of land in your lap. Has that been the case? You know, they just <laughs> hold my arms up. I, I don't know where else to go. I've come here to find support and try to find a way out of all of this. Is that accurate? I think it is, although I wouldn't say a way out as much as a way through. I think that one of the things that's so amazing is that because of the internet and because people have put effort into making sure that, you know, if someone needs grief beyond belief, they know about it. People really, we have people who join the page literally within days, days of a, you know, terrible loss. Um, and so, it's no, it used to be that so many people who joined were saying, you know, I really wish this had existed five years ago, 10 years ago when this person died. But now we have people join who are saying, hi, I'm here. Didn't, you know, didn't expect to be here, but, you know, my husband just died. My child died recently. Um, uh, we've had more than one person who's joined because they have a child or parent or spouse who is themselves terminally ill and they're expecting to be grieving, uh, which is just heartbreaking. I think the first time I read a parent saying, you know, the doctors have just given my child two months to live. It's like I even having been there. I have, you know, yeah. what on earth do you say to that? But the amazing thing is, even though it sort of started out feeling a little like I always had to make sure that I responded when someone joined because, you know, I didn't want anyone to post something to Grief Beyond Belief and get no response. It's really, it's a mutual grief support site. And one of the really great things that's happened, two changes happened over the course of the last year. One of them is that I finally uh, broke down and said, I need a vacation. And a, um, a woman stepped up, uh, her name is Nita, and she stepped up and said, you know, go take a break. I will admin the site while you're on vacation. And that was fantastic because all of a sudden it wasn't just me. Um, but also people started saying, we need a private space that's not a public Facebook page. And so um, we started a closed Facebook group, which is called Grief Beyond Belief Closed Group. Um, and it's very interactive. And in the closed group, Really, the you know, one person posts and they get just multiple responses. And it's been really beautiful seeing people take care of each other, which was really my purpose. My point was never to sort of start a site where I was going to provide counseling. What I wanted to do was create a site where people who were having that same experience of grieving rationally, Grieving, knowing that death was the end, um, grieving, not thinking, wow, I'm going to see them again in heaven, 
um, that those people would be able to take care of each other. When you hear the excuses, for lack of a better way of saying it, when you hear the stories of heaven and an eternal reunion and God needed another angel and this is all part of God's divine plan, having been through loss yourself, what happens in your mind and heart? I mean, do you get angry? Do you understand that they're, they're doing the best they can coming out of a religious culture? This is how they've been trained to speak. What happens in you when someone comes at you with this kind of bumper sticker recovery? When they come at me that way, talking about their own grief, I'm able to sort of just say, you know, that's not the kind of grief support we provide, but um, I wish you well. When people project that onto me, I find it infuriating. Um, and I find it, it's dismissive because the fact is, I am grieving the worst pain I have ever experienced. And for someone to say, oh, don't worry, you'll see your baby again in heaven. Well, I won't. That's not going to happen. And to sort of say don't worry because of it is to dismiss the pain I do experience. And I think a lot of people have that experience. Do you feel like your recovery and has been more healthy even though it's a harder reality, you won't be reunited at the pearly gates. But do you feel like that dealing with it in this way has been actually better for you? Would you go that far? Well, there is what I think is one of the strongest arguments in favor of grieving rationally, which is that a belief in heaven really does require either that you not think rationally or critically at all, that you don't do any real thinking about heaven um, and what what would that mean. Um, or you do think about it rationally and the result is almost always cognitive dissonance. I, mean, I can give an example. I remember soon after my son died, I would even knowing it wasn't true, I would sometimes have these little daydreams. I think, oh, you know, well, I know there is no heaven, but it would be so nice. And I know that my friends who who died, you know, previously uh, would be taking care of my son in heaven. And I'd be thinking, you know, so who would raise him if I wasn't there? Well, you know, my friends would raise him. My grandmother would raise him. And then I would think, but where would you go to college? And then I'd sort of end up laughing at myself and realizing that the whole thing is ridiculous, that when you think critically about the idea of an afterlife, the whole thing just completely falls apart. And so I think that people who who think critically but are trying to hold on to that belief, I think that's got to be very difficult. I mean, you know, um, cognitive dissonance is not a very comfortable state to be in. And if you think about the word comfortable, it really means sort of able to be comforted. And I don't quite see how one is able to be comforted at the same time as you're thinking, wow, this really doesn't make a whole lot of sense, whether it's what you're thinking about heaven or whether it's what you're thinking about, well, you know, they keep saying this is part of God's plan, but wow, that's a really dumb plan. Well, it's a heartbreaking plan. Why would you allow the birth of a beautiful child only to strip yeah. it away from mother and father so that you could then tell them, well, one day you'll be together again? It seems sort of sadistic or incompetent, one yeah. of the two. Absolutely. It makes no sense whatsoever, the whole idea that that would be a plan. And yet, you know, people, I mean, one of the problems with uh, that kind of outlook is that there's sort of, they want to have it both ways. If your baby lives, then God answers your prayer. If your baby dies, then God needed another angel. They always kind of have some explanation for it, but none of it makes a whole lot of rational sense. 
Rebecca, when someone comes to grief beyond belief, what do they get? I mean, is it community? Do you provide actual links and resources and articles and videos about grief recovery? I mean, let's say I'm a grieving parent or or whatever, and I come to, I mean, it could be anybody. I'm suffering loss, and I come to your website or Facebook page. What are What's that community going to provide? So I think, you know, I kind of have a list of the things that we provide. Um, you know, one thing obviously is sympathy, but most grieve, most people who are grieving kind of can get sympathy anywhere. It's that we provide sympathy without the I'll be praying for you, et cetera, stuff. I think also there's empathy. There's you're going to connect with people who have had the same experience or similar experiences. And so that in and of itself can be very healing to hear, you know, you're not the only person experiencing this. I mean, for me, you know, peer to peer grief support, like knowing that other people whose babies have died have similar experiences as what I have. Um, you know, I'm not the only one who's afraid to walk down the baby aisle in the drugstore, that sort of thing. Um, but there's also some evidence-based, you know, research out there about grief. And that's very useful. People kind of have these kind of pop culture ideas about grief. For exa example, the stages of grief. Well, it turns out that when research was done, you know, the stages of grief theory has been pretty thoroughly debunked at this point. And so it's useful for people to hear it, if you're not feeling, you know, denial, anger, et cetera, et cetera, um, then it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's not that you're doing it wrong. Um, actually, that's not the necessarily the most common pattern. And there's no evidence that says that there is any really consistent pattern of grief. Um, we also provide people with, I think one of the most healing things is an opportunity to talk about the person they've lost. Um, storytelling is such an important part of peer-to-peer -peer grief support. And so one of the first things we often ask a new member is, tell us something. And the stories people tell are so beautiful. Um, you know, I have, you know, I'm not going to lie. I spend a lot of time reading this stuff and, and crying and smiling and laughing um, periodically. Every so often, I will post to the Grief Beyond Belief membership, um, say, you know, today uh, we're going to talk about dark humor. And people will tell the funny stories about funeral, the, you know, the person who trips and drops something into the coffin. And, I'm, I'm, you know, people tell these things that to them were, you know, were the thing that made them laugh or the dark humor that the person who they've lost had. Um, but storytelling really helps. Uh, people also just really need a place to rant, especially people who are surrounded by um by really religious people and don't have a lot of people who understand who are willing to listen. Um, so we've had people tell just these stories, you know, the people who come to their parents' deathbed and try and convert their parent and how traumatic that was for their parent at their time of death and how traumatic it is for them to remember that. Um, People just incredibly frustrated with the stupid, insensitive stuff people say to them when they're grieving. And so, you know, having that place to express that's important. Um, and we also, people sometimes write, you know, that they're trying to figure, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in God's perfect plan. They don't believe in heaven. Um, but they're trying to sort of find some way to think about this that helps them through. And 
then other members are really able to respond with um, what Greta Christina calls comforting thoughts about death that have nothing to do with God. Um, with their philosophies, the the way they look at life and death that has gotten them through. Um, because I don't think there's a lot of that out there. And Grief Beyond Belief is one of the places people know they can come. And other people say, you know, um, this is painful. I miss my parent so much as well. But every day I see them in my own children and that makes this easier. Or, um, you know, yes, I'm going through grief, but this is the way that the person I've lost, you know, changed my life. And I know that everything I do carries them on with me into the future. Um, people really, religion is not does not provide the only comforting philosophies about death. Um, the nice thing about the comforting philosophies that rational thinkers have about death is that they're rational. It's pretty apparent that grief beyond belief is sort of your building of something mm. from the ashes. This is yeah. an empowering thing for you. It is something where giving comfort to others probably helps to alleviate the pain in your own life. It's part of your recovery, yes? I think it is. I mean, one of the most comforting thoughts for me is that the most painful thing that ever happened to me has led to something that helps other people. Um, and that Jude, it's not just me that, you know, it hurt me. It's that Jude's life and death is not without meaning. Um, and it's very hard when you have a little baby. It's not like, you know, you can say the way you would about an adult, oh, he taught me so much. It's hard for a little person who lives 90 days to have an effect on the world. And yet I would say Jude, you know, very indirectly had a big effect on the world. But I don't want Grief Beyond Belief to just be my project. Um, I think I had this fantasy that when I started it, you know, as soon as I started, as soon as someone stepped up and made it happen, that all these people would jump in and want to help. Um, I, you know, do think that it needs to build into a more sustainable um, community project rather than something that at this point remains such a somewhat um, individual project with, with a whole bunch of people helping. I mean, I have to say, without Greta Christina and all the atheist bloggers who uh, got the word out about Grief Beyond Belief, it wouldn't even, it would never have happened. Um, because people would have had no way to find out about it. Um, I have a amazing friend who is donating her time to create uh, Grief Beyond Belief's independent website, which uh, is not up yet, but is in the works, um, is something I could never have done on my own. Um, so people have been very helpful, but I really know that there needs to be a point at which I sort of let go, not necessarily and disengage from the project myself, but there need to be more people involved for it to be a sustainable project. Totally understand. Rebecca Hensler, founder of Grief Beyond Belief. I will link to the Facebook page in the description box of this show. So I would encourage anyone and everyone, even if you're not going through a particular tragedy or anything immediately relatable in your own life to still go and check out the community and, and know that it's there. And if you know someone in your own life who is deity free, who is not, you know, an, a, a part of a superstitious culture does not hold to mythology, does not believe that there is pie in the sky, but is dealing with real grief in the real world that you can perhaps sort of turn them on to it and say, look, this might be a place where you can find words of comfort, find materials that will help you rebuild mm -hmm. from what has been a life shattering 
circumstance. Any final thoughts here before I move on that you'd like to leave with anyone who might be grieving, going through some unthinkable tragedy in their own life right now? Well, obviously, I just want to um, offer my own uh, condolences is such a weak word, but, you know, my compassion to people who are grieving the tragedies of the last few weeks. It's just been a terrible time. I do not think that as a country, yeah, our government has done a very good job supporting non-believers in these times of um, national and community tragedy. And I'm really hoping that that is something that is going to change. Um, we really need as a country, um, we need to remember that people who are secular, that humanists and atheists and other uh, free thinkers are equally deserving of support and respect in their time of grief. Rebecca Hensler, thank you for everything you've done. I will do my best to continue to sort of broadcast the fact that your page is out there and making a difference. Thank you so much for the interview and for all the great work you do. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Um, can I just say one last thing? Of course. Uh, I really wanted to let you know that your show, not just the Grief Without God show, but other things that you've said along the way about the importance of really just stepping up and doing something and the way in which you felt like there was something you provided, you could provide, and you just went ahead and did it has been a real inspiration to me. So I want to thank you as well. I'm not sure that Grief Beyond Belief would exist without your show. Uh, you made my day. You made my month. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, I said it uh, when I was at the Reason Fest event, and I think I said it in Austin. I know you were down there for American Atheist. I, I keep coming uh -huh. back to it. I want to be an encourager. I mean, I don't want to be somebody who's who's you know blowing cotton candy up your ass. I want to be I want to be somebody who's giving you something real and and something that genuinely encourages you. And um, and so the fact that you were encouraged by any anything that happened on this site or in this show is just huge for me. That's absolutely huge. Thank you for that gift. I do appreciate it. You're welcome. It's All very right. good talking to you. All right, take Bye -bye. care, Rebecca. Thanks a bunch. Again, I'll make sure that I have the uh, link to Grief Beyond Belief in the description box of this show. That's awesome. That's just so amazing. You know, it, it's funny. This is a conversation. This show is, you know, and I'm not breaking any new ground. We're not, you know, uh, we're not, we're, you know, we're not talking uh, about uh, this unbelievably stratospheric level of science and philosophy and history and all this stuff. We're talking about real stuff that affects real people every single day. And so, man, that just absolutely floors me. I had an email in from Teresa. She said, loss is the hardest thing for me, especially as an atheist. Someone is alive and in a moment they're gone. That's it. No redos, no rewinds. It's just over. When my uncle died suddenly and much too young, I couldn't handle it. He was just gone. My cousin had comfort in the belief that she will see him again one day. She knows I'm an atheist and is fine with it. I can't imagine debating religion with her. One, because we don't try to convert each other. And two, because if one day she stops believing in God, it would be like losing her dad all over again. She lost him on this earth, and then she'd lose him again in a non-existent afterlife. My mother's a deist and pretty much admitted that she believes in God simply because life would be too sad and too hard without faith. I disagree with that way of thinking, but what do I do? The idea of my husband dying or my mother, a sibling, I just can't even think about it because it's too much. I hear atheists and scientists say they're okay with no afterlife. They're just so grateful to be a part of this world, this galaxy, this universe. They love that they get to be a part of this amazing life, even for just a short while. I understand that, but I cannot get past the sadness and heartache of death. Teresa, thanks for the message. Teresa, I did a video on this subject that I brought up in many conversations in this podcast, and I will do so again now. And I would encourage anyone within the sound of my voice who is... who is dealing with the idea of no afterlife. 
Maybe they fear death. Maybe you fear death. I, I, I'm afraid to die. The idea of not having a heaven. The finality of the death here on earth is overwhelming to me. And Teresa, I will admit, I will just say I'm guilty as charged that I make the argument that at least for my part, I, I want to maximize every moment here. Now, I know that doesn't really help with the emotional side of it. We all, you know, we've all got our moments where we think, Jesus, this is it. God, I don't want life to be over, blah, blah, blah. But the video Afterlife was designed to, number one, address the charge that the life of the non-believer has no meaning because we don't believe in God. I wanted to, to sort of put that on the table and just dissect it. The second thing I wanted to do was to was to address how precious every moment on this planet is. And three, I really wanted it to be kind of a poem. I wanted it to to sort of be Sagan-like, you know, do, you know, doing my best to try to channel Sagan, to try to, to look at the awe of this, you know, microsecond in time. And you know what? When we're gone, you know, we came from stardust and, and we will be again. It's this, it's this amazing cycle. Will, will, you know, will the, the uh, electrical activity in our brain cease? Yes. Will we essentially die? Yes. But, you know, we go on. And in this life, as we lose those who are precious to us, they continue on in our hearts and in our memories. As much as that sounds like an empty platitude, I'm absolutely convinced. You know, there are people in my life who I grieved. Tremendous loss. But I'll tell you, once the, the immediacy of the loss starts to wane a little bit and you start to see things through a larger lens, well, then you start being able to enjoy the amazing stories, the, the memories, you know, the things they used to say, the quirks they used to have, the little picadillos in their life that were, were unique to them, you know, the jokes they used to tell, the stories they used to enjoy, the talents that they had, the things they brought to your life that changed you, and the things that you will bring to the life of other people, and you will change them. In that way, we do continue on, at least from my perspective. And if you need a dose of encouragement, I would encourage you to go to YouTube, to the Thinking Atheist page, and uh, seek, search for the, um, the video called Afterlife. I was very fortunate I had uh, some of my favorite people on the internet uh, come and join me in a collaborative effort. Matt Dillahunty's voice is heard. Christina Rad, DPR Jones, Healthy Addict is there, R and Raw, Evidence, uh, Dark Matter 2525. I mean, it's just awesome to see all these people so eager to sort of lend their perspectives. And I didn't script it for them. I said, I want to know what you think. And so they just sort of opened the microphone and, and just shared their own thoughts and perspectives on the matter. And when I got the audio in, they just sort of, they just sort of fit. <laughs> All the puzzle pieces fit and it, and it became this sort of transcendent video piece that to this day is one of the works I'm the most proud of. It, it just gives me tremendous joy anytime and every time somebody sees Afterlife and then they contact me and said it made a difference in their life. Let's go to the phones and talk to area code 701. Thank you so much for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Steve in North Dakota. Thank you for calling and for waiting on me, Steve. What can I do for you tonight? Well, I sent you a letter and a book I did, but I was uh, I recently went through uh, a death of my mother in January, and the people that, uh, they were all real nice trying to be helpful and stuff, but they, you know, using the, the uh, religious tones and things like that, which I can understand and I appreciate their sympathy, but it did get a little bit uh, irritating. The hardest part for me is I'm actually a physician, and I've seen death so many times and seen so many deaths that really didn't make any sense, you know, why they were there. But to see my own mother die was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. How do you sort of deal with the memory now? Is it, I mean, how, how long has it been? 
she died on January 7th of this year. So this is still a, a pretty fresh ordeal that you're going through. How are you doing? Yes. I mean, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm, I, you know, the, the process is, is I keep thinking about her and all kinds of things keep coming up. Uh, you know, I'm, we, uh, originally from Omaha and we had to, t I took her back down to Omaha to be buried next to my father. And some of the relatives showed up, you know, and they were doing the religious thing. And one thing my wife got upset about was, um, her, my granddaughter's, uh, other grandma said, "Well, we, I talked to you, and she's in she's in heaven with the angels now." And my wife could have just hit her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, obviously, you know, I find people grasping at straws, right? They're grasping at any, even a weak or piece of encouragement to try to make a difference. It's, it's. I can see how it would be. You'd almost blanch if someone came up and told you it was God's will. <laughs> yeah, I can see how that would be an irritant for sure. How do you how do you get through the grief? What has been your coping mechanism? My coping mechanism has been realizing um, the good times that we had together. My father died a, uh, a month and a half after I graduated from high school. So, and he died suddenly from a heart attack, which I still blame myself because I still think I should have called should have called the ambulance and have him come get him, but he didn't want it. So I woke up in the morning and he was gone. So since that time, you know, my mother and I grew really, really close. And she always been a big supporter. And, you know, she was always there when I needed her. And the last few years of her life, she she had emphysema, and then my stepfather died a few years ago, and she ended up in the hospital a lot, so I decided to bring her up here and be with her. So I was able to go in and see her every night. I would maybe go in and see her maybe for 10 minutes or maybe an hour or two. And so, you know, that was good. That Those are good times, but I've also seen her progressively got worse, and I knew it was coming, and still, it's not believable. Yeah, it's just, it just can't do it. It just, it, it, it's still a, it's hard to, hard to swallow. I, I so, myself find myself I, being thankful, though, that you know, if she's going to go through this ordeal that she went through it with you rather than without you, you know, the fact that she was able to share time with you, that you were there to, you know, to give her a, a, a touch, a kind word, a voice, support to meet needs, to do all of that stuff is a huge gift, man, you know, a huge gift to her. And I think I would have to think that it made the final months that she had at least better than they would have been. Certainly had she been elsewhere. Yeah. Well, my cousins and I, we, you know, she, my cousins brought up their father, which is her brother, you know, and he down in Texas and they haven't seen each other. They hadn't seen each other for 10 years. And this was the first of December. So only a few weeks before, I'm really thankful that they actually were able to bring him up and they were able to see each other for the last time. So, but the thing that gets me is when I was watching her, you know, we put her in uh, hospice because she was having such a hard time, and that hurt really bad, and seeing her suffer. And I remember she says, no, I'm not suffering. And then the last thing I, one of the last things I remember her doing is she gave me a great big old smile, and then she just went unconscious. So, wow. And I watched that. And like I said, I'm a physician, so I've seen a lot of people die, and I've a lot of, seen a lot of this kind of stuff. But still, when it's a family member that you're very close to, it's different. Yeah. Well, you've got an entire community that supports you. And can I say that I'm so glad to meet a free thinking physician. I mean, I, I love doctors anyway. I love people in the medical community who never get the gratitude they deserve anyway. But I know you're a person of science and you're out there making a difference and while everybody's rubbing their crucifixes around their necks. 
you know, everybody's throwing platitudes up to the sky and thanking God for the work of human hands. You're in there in the thick of it, and I want to say thank you for the work that you do. Well, I appreciate that. I got your. I ordered your T-shirt and got your T-shirt about thanking the doctor. No, oh, really? God, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that that it's not a. I mean, it's not going to win any awards. The design of the shirt, though, has the has a the, an illustration of a physician. I think he's got a scalpel, and it and it lists all of these maladies that have been treated. And at the bottom, in large type, it says "Thank a doctor." And because it it's kind of something that's a hot button with me. I mean, even this week, I. I had a family member who had a, a horrible burn on on their leg, you know, boiling water was down there. And the whole time I'm watching the comment section and people are like, prayers, prayers, I'm praying, praying for you, pray, pray, pray. And the whole time I know that there was an emergency room physician who, who treated it and she's probably on antibiotic ointment. I mean, who knows what's going on, but it's it's trained human right. hands that are part of the solution. And yet God is the one who, who sort of gets the high five. It must make you even crazier being in the med medical community. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting whenever the person, you know, does well and survives, you know, God gets the credit. If something goes wrong, it's the doctor that's blamed. Doc, God goes out the window. Yeah. It's the doctor. The problem. Yeah, let's and get God no, to carry malpractice insurance and see how that goes. Over. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, you are precious man. And I wish you the best. I, I don't have any, honestly, any words I offer up now. I feel like I fear would be just wouldn't be enough, but, but just know that we we're with you, you know, and you've got a community of people who, uh, who feel your pain, my friend. And, and thank you for listening and for, for being a part of this podcast. It means a whole lot. I appreciate it very much, Seth. All right, take care, Thank Steve. Thank you very much, and thanks for all you do, man. It's my pleasure. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye-bye. I had an email in from Penelope. She said, I'm 25, I live in Australia, and I have been an outed atheist for the last four years. For all of my life before then, I was a very deeply indoctrinated Christian. My mother taking my older sister and I to church every week of our lives to the point where I was at the church more days in the week than I wasn't. I felt very strong in my belief and was always the top of the class in Sunday school and scripture classes during the week. This faith was properly tested for the first time in my life when I was 15 and my mother was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cervical cancer. Some cancer cells that had lain dormant in her for most of my life becoming active again and quickly spreading through her body. Despite this aggressive spreading, she was sick for over a year, her body transforming from the strong rock of the family to literally a shell of her former self. However, during this year, we continued to go to church regularly and the church family built a wall of support around us, praying for mom, but also cooking for her, bringing her flowers, driving her around town, and trying to give assistance wherever possible. Of course, as a 15-year-old, I did not see that this is all being nearly as serious as it was, and I just ended up getting frustrated with how long it was taking her to get better so we could get on with our lives. When she died seven days before Christmas in 2003, I felt like the world had been yanked out from under me. I kept going to church, but it all felt like an inane buzzing around my ears. I tried to make sense of the world around me and work out how my faith tied into this situation. But with my mother gone, my sister at boarding school, and my father, a keeps-to-himself atheist, also grieving, I couldn't get a strong grasp on anything. I kept coming back to one particular memory. When she was very ill, my mother went up to the front of the church for prayer after a service. The pastor prayed with her and told her that she would be okay because he saw a vision of her at my wedding. The memory of this so-called vision plagued me because I couldn't get past why the pastor had seen this if it was so obviously false. This confusion sent me into a tortured state that lasted longer than I wished to declare. Long story short, I eventually realized I had stumbled into atheism. This year will mark the tenth year since her passing, and I can now talk about it with ease. I miss her very much, but the years make it easier, and I now find that I can help my friends who fear death and struggle with the deaths of loved ones. 
I find that having a more personal understanding of death and its permanence has helped me to grasp what is really important in life. And just this year, I've been successfully following a New Year's resolution, the first of my life that I've held to for more than a week, to spend less time on the people and things that hold me back and drag me down, and invest more of my time and passion in the people who lift me up and are worthy of my love. Embracing my atheism has boosted not only my happiness, but also my acceptance of my grief and has helped me to let my mother go. Time heals all wounds. It just takes, well, time. Thank you for all that you do, Penelope. Beautiful letter, Penelope. Thank you so much for being a part of the show and for sharing what is a deeply personal story. Area code 240, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Thank you so much for waiting. Who is this? Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Thanks for waiting on me. What do you have for us tonight? Hi. Um, I forgot I was listening on the phone, not the radio. You just actually read my email. Oh. Well, if you're listening on the phone, I'll just put you right back on hold. You can continue to listen there. That is that what you'd like? Oh, I mean, I could. I would like to talk. Teresa, talk to okay, me about um, your letter. Talk to me about your experience. Yeah, I just always had a, a really hard time with dealing with the death part because, oh, like I said in my email, it's just, it's done, it's over. And um, I, I'm i at a loss whenever, um, like one time I was, in a, I was in a plane that was about to go down. And when my uncle was in the ICU and I found myself wanting to pray, wanting to beg God to make this not happen, what I think is going to happen. But then I was just stuck thinking, I, that's not going to do anything, yeah. you know, and I didn't know. Well, just, it, I feel like not believing God takes away my hope, even if it's a false sense of hope when you believe that praying works, it's still some kind of comforting hope. Teresa, I understand why people say the things they say. I understand why it's so attractive to them to to have a, a place where there is no pain and no violence and no tragedy and nothing but joy, a place where they'll be reunited with everyone they've ever known and loved and the family dog, you know, it's hell, I, you know, part of that sounds pretty attractive to me too. <laughs> you know, I totally, yeah. <laughs> I totally get it. I mean, I, I understand. And we grow up many times for words of comfort. Anyone who's attended a religious funeral has seen the ham hand, often ham handed sort of, uh, sermonizing where they talk about, well, you know, he, he wasn't a religious man, but I know that he had a relationship with God and God loved him. And one day, I mean, you know, well, come on, I knew the guy, he wasn't religious at all. You're just reaching. You are trying to comfort the 75 people mm -hmm. who are sitting out here in the pews. Now, let me throw this out at you, Teresa. You mentioned you were in the plane and you thought the plane was going to go down, right? Uh -huh. And who was it you said who was, you felt was close to death at that time? Would you say uncle? Oh, I, these are two separate occasions. I was in a yeah. plane of just two separate things. Yeah, but the, but the other, oh, the second uncle. story, yeah. who was it? Was it an uncle? My uncle. Okay. Was he had been, he'd been sick a long time? Was he elderly? I mean, you know, was um, it kind of a was, gradual, you expected, you knew this was coming kind of a thing? Well, he had cancer and then it was fine and then it was not fine and then it was fine. Yeah. And he came home from the hospital on the, I think on Christmas Day, and then the next day we got a phone call saying he's in the ICU, wow. and that was just a horrible 12 hours of maybe it'll be okay, probably not, and um, that was that moment of desperation where I just, I wanted to pray, but I knew that wasn't do well, I wanted to draw a sort of a circle around two different scenarios and I'll sort of embellish one of them mm -hmm. so I can prove, I can prove, I can make the point or throw it out there and ask you for your opinion. You know, being in a plane and all of a sudden you feel like, you know, you're going down like a sudden tragedy. You're still young, you know, you're still, and I'll call 65 young. I mean, you're not your time is supposedly not come. <laughs> and, and that's mm -hmm. one thing, but I have found that when I hear about or have experienced in my own family the death of someone who is very advanced in years, 85, 90, even 95. I mean, it, you know, the, I've had women in my family live a long time <laughs> that, you know, near the end, they are actually at peace. They are, they're kind of ready. Uh, have you, have you heard that? Have you experienced that? Someone says, you know, I had a good run. 
Uh, I know that my body's starting to fail me. I've, I've, I've been surrounded by love. I'm ready for the end. Have you ever heard anything like that? Yes, and I cannot imagine, even if I was 120 years old, ever feeling like that. But, you know, maybe maybe our perspectives change as our environment changes. As we grow older yeah. and as we live more and we create more memories and we look back and we think, yeah, you know, it, it, I had a good run. And uh, especially, I think, if you're if you were beginning to suffer physically, if you thought I'll never be able to to walk from one room to the other, I'll have to be wheeled from one room to the other. I'm not always lucid. My body will fail and I might be in a vegetative state. All of those types of things as your body fails near the end, you might think, you know, I'd like to I'd like, you know, now would be a good time. I want to be surrounded by my loved ones, put on some of my favorite music and we'll just say goodbye sort of on my terms. I don't know. I, I, I've heard some stories along those lines, and it's always fascinated me. Death scares you? Yes. Like thinking about when people, you know, an aneurysm pops or something completely unexpected, and then yeah. that's it. You know, though, you can't, you know, you you can't, Teresa, you can't dwell on what might happen. I mean, I I always say, be prepared for the worst, but expect the best. You know, you can't walk outside and look at a backpack on the street tomorrow and immediately run for cover, (laughs) you know, thinking that it might be an explosive. We we honestly, I'm not thinking that all the time. (laughs) You can what if yourself (laughs) into an early grave. Think of how much of your life you would miss if you spend all that time worrying about what might happen. No, I mean, you've got, you sound like a relatively young and vibrant person. You've got a lot of good years ahead of you. It seems to me this would be the time to extract all the joy that you can out of life, you know? Right. And I do just some, you know, sometimes something will cross my mind and go watch, just go watch afterlife. All right. That's your homework tonight. All right. Just when you hang up YouTube, I want you to watch afterlife and I want you to crank it up. All right. Just crank it up nice and loud and just see if seven minutes of that will, will take you to a happy place. Okay. (laughs) All right. Thank you, Seth. Take care, Teresa. Thanks for the call. You know, you. I, I feel like my, you know, my little encouragement has just come up so empty. You know, I mean, I'm like, you know, you sound young and you sound so vibrant and you no, know, you have so much to live for. I, you know, I'm, but it's honestly how I feel. I mean, it, you can what if yourself into an early grave. And I'm not saying you're not vigilant. I'm not saying you don't have your eyes and ears open. You're not walking in and always being thinking, you know, situationally, you know, I need to be prepared. I'm talking about people who are so busy trying to prevent death, they forget to live life. Man, don't forget <laughs> to live life. I got a, I got somebody, I'm, I'm not going to tell you who they are, but they're, they're in my life. Uh, they're uh, kind of distant on the family tree. Worry. About and this is a religious person. They worry about everything. Going on a ski trip. Oh man, yeah, that's dangerous. You know, you could hit a tree. You know, it's you heard about an accident I read about in the paper where so and so was killed at a ski resort. It was horrible. Oh, I'm gonna go on a road trip. Oh, you know, all those miles you put on the car, you just never know. You know, you increase the odds. The more you're on the highway, that you're gonna be in a wreck. (laughs) What? Yeah. I actually said, do you talk on your cell phone or do you text? And I said, well, I mean, these days I, I text probably more than I talk. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Well, why are you glad to hear that? Well, you know, if you hold the phone up to your head, you're going to get cancer. I just stared at him, you know, like, <laughs> are you wait, hang on. I know the science is still coming in. Look, I know all of that, but I'm, my larger point is, is this is the first place he goes. Everything is a potentially lethal situation. I'm amazed the guy leaves his freaking house. And one day he's going to pass away and he will have spent so much time extending the years of his life or worrying about it that to a degree he will have forgotten how to live life. Think of all the memories he won't have created. All of the amazing times he might have had with family. All the opportunities to sort of stretch himself, to try something new. You know, to have a story you could tell at parties. Think about it. 
I'm not saying he has to be an adventurer. That's not how he's wired. Hell, that's not how I'm wired. I'm more of a settler than a pioneer always have been. But the idea that you're just going to fear death... No, I don't, I don't want to die. I don't want to. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. You're going to wake up and you're going to be 70. And you're going to look back at all the time you spent sitting on your hands trying to prevent a death that's going to happen anyway. Look, n nobody gets out of it alive. Right? Death will come for us all. Have you not seen the movie? Christopher Hitchens. In the tribute video I produced shortly after his death, there's a, a, a clip of a young Hitchens, younger, and he, I, I'm going to totally butcher his analogy. And of course, if you butcher Christopher Hitchens, it's almost like an, an unholy, I know I'm going to get, please, please don't crucify me. <laughs> But he, but he talks about, you know, when you're born, it's like you're shot out of your mother's womb and you're heading toward demise. You know, you're heading toward a wall filled with with rusty nails or whatever it is. You know, there is a beginning and there is an end. You know, it's coming. So the point is to try to fill out those remaining years in the middle. In how did he say it? An interesting and ironic way. I, I, you'll have to see the, the tribute video is on my YouTube page and he just says it so well. And of course, every time I watch it, I get a lump in my throat. I just, you know, he, he got it. You know, there's a beginning and there's an end. And what are you going to do with all this time here in the middle? What are you going to do? I had an email from Espen who said, I first started listening to your podcast around June of last year. The first podcast I heard was Overcoming Without Religion with guest Dr. Daryl Ray. Now, let me digress for just a second. I mentioned the, um, the grief without God. This is a great sort of a uh, supplement to that particular show. It doesn't really cover just grief. It's more about the broader issue of, do you, can you overcome tragedy? Yes. But, you know, people who beat addiction, people who are coming out of difficult circumstances, how do you overcome without religion? And Daryl Ray, who is awesome, was an amazing guest on the show. So there's another one that you need to look up and listen to. Trust me, it's an encouraging show. And Daryl Ray is one of those guys who can cheerlead you. Like, you know, by the time you're done talking to the guy, you, you want to just go out and just build, the, you know, <laughs> build the Empire State Building. <laughs> you just want to go out and do something. You feel empowered. This is his gift. Back to the letter. Espen says, at the time, my grandfather, 86, had fallen seriously ill and was not expected he would survive. I had visited him two days before, and even as I was listening to the podcast, I received a text from my mother saying he had died earlier that morning. I was at work at the time, and I remember having to take a walk outside to calm my nerves before going back. I finished listening to the podcast, and while doing so, I spent a lot of time thinking about the kind of life I knew my grandfather had lived. He'd come of age during the war, during which Norway, I'm Norwegian, he says, was occupied. The post-war years were hard here. Rationing of some goods lasted until the 60s, and the country was nowhere near as rich as it is now. My grandfather worked as a lumberjack and a carpenter. And one might expect that a physical laborer living under conditions of such relative hardship might grow into a taciturn and very serious sort of person. While it is true, he was always the sort of guy who fixed things, got things done, and generally seemed able to MacGyver up anything you could imagine. MacGyver, awesome reference, 80s reference, everybody under the age of 30, look it up. He was also the kind of man who enjoyed having a good time. If a good time was not being had, he used his talents of getting things done to make sure the people around him did have a good time. My grandfather was a son, a husband, a father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. He was a soldier, a carpenter, a handyman, and he could ruin a stick shift from 50 feet away just by looking at it. Long story. The last thing I said to him as he lay in his bed two days before his death was, You've worked so hard for so long. No one will hold it against you if you rest now. I don't know if he heard me, but he squeezed my hand at that. 
I was personally struggling with depression at the time, unrelated to my grandfather's death, your show, you and Dr. Ray, had the good fortune to come along at precisely the right time. You helped me realize that my grandfather was gone, his time was up, but that he had made the most of that time. He'd made it his time on his terms and filled it with what mattered to him. The memories and experiences that were him are gone now, but they mattered so much to him while he was here. I don't think he regretted very many of them. And there is my comfort. I could go on and on, of course, but this has already turned out longer than I'd expected. I will round it up by mentioning that this show also helped me to make the decision to consult my doctor about my depression. I was diagnosed with a chronic depression bordering on severe and was prescribed medication, which helped me a lot. I have no idea if you subscribe to the if I can only save one, it is worth it theory of thinking, but if you do, you should know you are at least well on your way to your one with me with regards. Thank you, Espen. Thank you so much for that, man. Thank you. It's funny, you know, um, when you're in the faith and depression comes up, again, I digress, but people talk about depression. They see it as an attack of the evil one, right? To them, it's not a chemical imbalance, you know, that's triggered by environmental things. They see it as you must be out of God's will or it is an attack of Satan, right? How could you not have joy in your life? You have, you have so much to be happy about, right? They're dealing with it on these terms. Now, God loves you so much and you have a beautiful family and you've got a good job. And, and you know, you so many other people out there have it so much worse. And, oh, you know, you are so blessed, quote unquote. You're so blessed and you have nothing to be depressed about. This is, this is a crayon kind of a counseling. It's tremendously nauseating surface counseling where they think that by talking to you in bumper stickers, it's going to change the very real and often very, very physical problem within your body. And while depression is still kind of a crapshoot out there, we continue to, to learn more about it every single day. We're still trying to sort of tame the tiger. We're trying to figure out what are the triggers. And depression is so different in so many different people, and much of it is it's subjective. And when someone says, I'm depressed, I mean, how do you diagnose it? All of these things are out there. I do not envy the physician trying to accurately diagnose it. But I'll tell you, you live in a time when modern medicine is actually providing real solutions instead of people looking you in the eye with that sort of Mentos commercial expression on their face and saying, well, just remember that Jesus loves you. Hell, that'd make me depressed. <laughs> Thanks for nothing. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go back to the switchboard quickly here and talk to area code 775. Thanks for waiting. Who's this? 775. Hey, Seth. Hey, Seth, it's uh, the shaman and his wife. How are you both? We're doing just fine, actually. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is call back in on this show because our daughter's birthday was Saturday. Wow. How are you guys doing? We're, we're hanging in there. Now, hang on just okay, a second. On, Kat, hang on just a second. Uh, for, the, for those who have not heard the original show, I, I have to do due diligence here and sort of set the stage. So can you give me just the, the short version of why you had called and what you've been through? The short version is back on April 20th of 2009, I gave birth to a daughter who was DOA pretty much. She was deceased already. And over that short period of time, I had pretty much lost everything and found more comfort through being online in a game called Second Life uh -huh. than I had with a lot of my own family, who was a lot of God had a reason, she's in heaven now, and all they cared about was how I was doing. Now, talk to me about this is sort of an interesting experiment. I mean, did Second Life allow you to sort of detach from your own skin and be someone else until the grief passed? How, yes. how did that help you? Yes. 
It did. And Wes is here, too. So Hi, Wes. Uh, yeah, if it weren't for the video game, she would have gone nuts. And I, I was the one who had to deal with family and friends and everything else. And after about two weeks of it, I was, I think I may have lost a good half inch of enamel on my teeth because yeah. of all the, uh, grinding I did. Now she's keeping busy, right? Is that the deal? She's yeah. keeping her mind busy. Yeah. She's not stopping to think. She's sort of living in someone else's skin, virtually doing that kind of thing. And so here you are over here and you're handling what? You're taking the phone calls and reading the thank you. Note I'm or taking the, the, the phone calls. Yeah, not the thank you I'm notes, but the condolence and, cards. Yeah. And after a while, I finally got sick of it and I just started screaming at people. You know, if your God took my daughter because he's got some kind of grand plan, then he's one sick fucking bastard. <laughs> Pardon my language. Let it out, man. I, did. They know. I, blew Let up it at, out. I blew up at this one guy who was friends with my, uh, who's been friends with my family, and now he won't even talk to me anymore. Am I hearing because a cat? What is that? That, that is, is one of our cats. <laughs> No, look, a cat, few things comfort as much as a purring cat, like sitting in your lap. Yes. Until they flip out and claw you and go crazy and run in the other room. Until they, until that multiple personality thing kicks in, a a cat purring on your lap is therapeutic. It just brings joy. Just hearing it the is. sound and makes me happy. She's actually a very special cat because when during my pregnancy, her mother. And her siblings would all curl up around my feet, my back, and my belly during my entire pregnancy because I would sleep on the couch. And they would sit there and they would purr. So I always had that comfort there with them. Well, I think it was a month or two months after her mother gave birth to her outside because they got out while I was visiting my dad. And... We found her one night after we had brought her inside. And you know how cats will get those, you'll shine a light in their eyes and they'll, you'll get that bright white. Hers were sky blue wow. instead of white. And he had the feeling that it was, because remember, he's, he still believes. He had the feeling that it was our daughter come back to us in a form that she could. That was his I'm just, thought. I'm just sitting here listening. You know, that that's loud. That's like a Harley Davidson fat boy over there that, that I'm listening to. <laughs> He's very loud. <laughs> Somebody's revving the engine. Well, I'm glad to hear your, both of your voices. I, I know that you guys have really managed to put put your lives back together. And I know it didn't come easily, but you've also given joy by even watching the chat room and and whatnot. You two have become family to this community, <laughs> and you've given a lot of joy to the people who participate in it. So I'm, I'm grateful for you both. I'm so glad you called today, and, and thanks for encouraging so many out there, okay? You're welcome, and also to the chat, because they're yelling. Thank you guys as well for all the support that you guys have thrown to us. Awesome. All right. Both of you take care. We'll talk again soon, all right? <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. Thank you. Do you remember that story? It's been years. I believe it was a nursing home or a retirement home. And they had a cat. And the cat would all of a sudden find a room to go in. Would select a room is a better way of saying it. And would go into whoever was in that room and would spend almost all of his time in there with the person. And on the average of about three days after this began, that person would pass away. And the article was talking about, does the cat sense that this person's life is sort of ebbing away? You know, that their ticket is about to get punched and go in there and sort of, I don't know, Comfort them. And, you know, I, I'm, I, do, I believe animals sense things, not in a spiritual way. It's like when somebody walks up to your front porch and knocks on the door. And if your dog goes up 
and you know the dog might wag his tail and be excited or from time to time there will be someone there and your dog's the hair just stands up you know and the shoulders square and you can feel it i mean the dog senses something I, and i don't know what that is I, again i don't see it as a spiritual thing you know he, he has a bad spirit you know that i don't see that but i do think animals pick up on stuff so did this cat for some reason, sense, I don't know what other word to use, that it was almost time and spent two, three, four days in there, just sleeping right there on the bed during this person's final days. When I first heard the story, I made the joke that if I was lying in there, Right, and I'm 80 years old, and a cat, that cat walks into my room. I'd be like, "Get that cat out of here!" <laughs> I would flip out. <laughs> oh my God, I'm gonna die! I would have a heart attack. You know, I, I would be throwing pillows. You know, banish the beast. No, I actually would, but it just makes me it just makes me laugh to think about that particular scenario. I had um, an email in from Brian. My mother passed away, he says, just as March arrived this year, and I was fortunate enough to be able to be present. I'm active duty Air Force. Thank you for your service, Brian. He says, my parents both are and were young earth, devil hid the dino bones, fire and brimstone believing Christians. I am not, though, like yourself and Matt Dillahunty, at one time I was complete with youth leadership roles in a massive church. I actually didn't. Well, I guess I was a youth leader, yeah. Uh, and like you both, I was, quote, lukewarm for a number of years before finally coming to the realization some five, six years ago that it was okay not to believe, thanks in no small part to my new friend at a base to which I'd been recently stationed. About three years later, almost two years ago now, my mom was diagnosed with a new aggressive form of colon cancer. She was initially given, quote, maybe six weeks if you're lucky, unquote. There were a myriad of issues. The cancer seemed to be 10 plus years of growth, but she'd had a recent colonoscopy that showed nothing. This was the basis for a diagnosis that put her into a new level of treatment, and she was accepted into drug trials and given experimental treatment. It seemed to be working, and though over the course she lost 100 plus pounds, she seemed to be doing well. Aside from trying to, quote, save me before she died, although it was all done with respect. And then I got the call from my grandmother. She was crying. My aunt, my mom's sister, had just suddenly and unexpectedly passed. This was about a year ago. My grandmother had to deal with her youngest getting cancer and her oldest dying within about eight months of each other. But at least my mom seemed to be doing better. My wife, Britt wrote you about this subject back after my aunt died, and then less than two months ago, my mom went into a catatonic state and was put into hospice care. I flew out to be there. After a week and a half on hospice, she succumbed to her cancer. My dad was inconsolable, as one would expect, but the rest of us were more in a state of shock and maybe a bit of relief that the ordeal was finally over. She lost all of her distinguishing features and looked nothing like my mom by the end. She had picked out a spot to be buried a few months prior, along with opting not to be embalmed and a cardboard casket. The service was at a little church in our relatively small town in Southern California with a pastor I'd known since I was maybe seven years old, a good friend of my dad. But during the service, as the pastor would read and try to elucidate a point, all of which seemed rather strained and contorted to get to a specific view, my dad would jump in and argue the very basics of the theology with him. It was awkward, yet illuminating. They all had their ideas of what the afterlife promised, and it always seemed to reflect their own personalities, their own wants and hopes. For me, my mom was gone. I have a lot of things to remember her by. She was a published author, 
though not in any significant way, and we shared a lot of discussions. For my money, she was the intellectual lot of my parents, and though she could reason through just about anything, she just couldn't get past the religion. I say all this to mean that while she and I had our differences, we had a lot of love, and now that she's gone, there's a bit of a hole there. But it's getting better. It does get better. It just takes time. It seems like anything else is just placating yourself. Beyond that degrades the importance of the time you had. It's no longer as special because you're going to see her again. I almost feel like it disrespects the memory by implying that it was only a small drop of the time you will eventually spend and in the horrible mortal realm at that. How do I cope? Remembering, spending time with family, especially my grandma, when I can. Trying to better myself in the hopes that my own impact on this world will equal or surpass those that came before me. Find a goal, a reason life is precious, and you can celebrate the lives of those that died. You can mourn. You must. It might be said you can only properly mourn without religion. Because what do you mourn if the loss is only temporary? Brian, thank you so much for the letter. I've got time for one more call. Let's go back to the switchboard and talk to area code 919. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who is this? Uh, this is Alex, Seth. How are you doing? I'm well. Thanks for calling. What do you have for us tonight? Well, uh, a few things. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you and Rebecca um, for all you do as far as building communities are concerned. I think that's the, the number one aspect that's plaguing the secular movement and, and the atheist movement in our in our society today is that lack of community building. And, and we see that being so successful in the religious sphere and the, and the lack thereof is, is, is uh, I think, what, in my personal opinion, we need to be working on the most. So I, I really, really appreciate what you guys do there. It's um, a pleasure. Thank you. About that. Yeah, and then about that cat story, too, is I think that's that's a perfect thing that's ripe for a, a double-blind study where we can deprive the cat of all of its normal senses to <laughs> determine if it's something other than sight, sound, smell, and all that, and to see if that cat has something else going on there. But who I'm knows? I'm going to have to Google uh, that story and find out what that was all about. <laughs> you know, It's been several years, but it was the kind of thing you talk about at parties. Hey, did you hear that story about the cat in the nursing home? So what else do you have for me, Alex? Well, um, a couple things. Uh, one, I had, I had a friend um, a while ago. We got in a rollover accident, and, uh, and he died. And, uh, you know, I pulled him out of the car, and we had the whole immediate medical attention thing with me and uh, another guy that we were with. And, uh, you know, in the months that followed that, it was, uh, you know, just lots of the same, you know, what you've already talked about on the show. You know, you're going to see him again. Um, it wasn't your time. I dealt with a lot of that, the guilt, the survivor guilt. Um, which was very weird for me to, because I, I started out going into that situation with a very, what I consider to be rational and skeptical mindset, and dealing with the the, up, the the emotional upwelling that I couldn't control of that survivor guilt was a really weird experience for me. Um, and it, really, all all it took was time. I think that was my main coping mechanism. But um, you know, the reason I brought it up was mostly that the, the it wasn't your time thing is such a vacuous statement. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it just doesn't, it, it's just meaningless. And, and like you've said also earlier in this, so I'm, I'm really going to repeat a lot of what's already been brought up on the show, but it, it's just people tr trying to make sense of it in their own way. And I appreciate that. And I certainly didn't berate anybody that, that was coming to me with that. Um, but it, it just seems so hollow to me, and it really had offered absolutely no consolation, um, especially because when you look at the car, um, it was just absolutely destroyed on his side. And on my side, both of us were not wearing seatbelts. We're the only two people in the vehicle. Um, you know, it, it was just, it could have been me, it could have been him, it could have been both of us, and it just happened to go that way. Um, so it was kind of a weird weird sen sense and uh Does it you know, sort of heighten your senses as far as how you treat every moment moving forward i mean is forgive the cliche but do you think wow i i got another shot is that pass through that, your mind that, that's exactly yeah that's that's very poignant and that's exactly what has the, the lesson or whatever you want to call it that i've taken from that experience has been exactly that and and that's actually it, it was years ago when this happened but it's it's contributed heavily toward my disbelief and toward my 
kind of seizing the moment, carpe diem, you know, this is all we've got. I got to make the most of this thing because look what happened to this. My friend of mine is my best friend at the time. And, and that was that. And, you know, that, that's really all I need to say on that. Uh, my, my other thing that I wanted to bring up was that I had a, a grandmother who was a, a school counselor in public schools and was really the most moral, kind, loving person I've ever met to this day. And I was raised Mormon. And in Salt Lake City, Utah, and her lack of religion automatically meant that she'd be sent to a lower kingdom in the afterlife than me, you know, and and, uh, and for me growing up, and especially into my teenage years, and when I was really coming to the age of reason, imagining this system where the most ethical and loving and moral kind person I knew would be punished for not thinking like I did, it, it really had a profound influence on me and contributed to my disbelief and departure from that religion. And she recently lost a long battle with ovarian cancer, and to my, well, I shouldn't say I was shocked, but, but to my interest, I was surprised that she didn't really ever turn to superstition or any sort of uh, deathbed conversion type of scenario. But she really ha you know, had a brave conviction in dying gracefully without superstition. And in doing that, it, it really solidified it in my mind that it's not only possible, but honorable and admirable to die in that method. And, and Hitchens proved that as well. Um, you know, and, and I didn't realize that I'd be so affected by both her death and Hitchens' death. It was the most surprising to me was that I, I was kind of, we, you know, we all knew he was on the way out, most likely. And uh, uh, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who was shocked by how profoundly I was affected by his death. It um, rattles your cage. Watching the tribute. You it know, really he, did. And he, watching those tributes over the next couple of days was, was really profound. I think we see, you know, incidences of life cut short around us and we, we get our cage rattled and we think, man, I don't want to be 70 years old and look back and say, I wish, I wish I had done this. You know, I wish I'd started a website and I wish I'd been out sort of speaking my mind on the issue of what I consider to be ridiculous, superstitious thinking. I wish, I wish I hadn't been so interested in trying to make everybody else happy. That kind of thing is the kind of, that's the conversation that goes, uh, that goes, you know, on in my mind. And, and quite frankly, as I get older, I find myself apologizing less for just opening my mouth and for jumping in where I normally would have just sort of deferred so maybe there's a lesson there yeah and that's that's the only reason i really brought it up too is it, it had that same effect that losing my friend had on me was that yeah. it really brought a poignancy to the now and the moment and that one day all you'll be is a memory and it's on us to try our best to be a good one alex i think you're going to be a good one my friend i do appreciate the call <laughs> thanks for sharing your story man take care of yourself great all right take it easy sir. All right, thank you you know, Hitchens' name comes up so often, I, I find myself sort of feeling like I should almost apologize. And then I stop and go, why should I apologize for invoking Hitchens? I mean, the guy was a wordsmith. The guy was an amazing mind. And he is so quotable that I actually, on the Thinking Atheist Facebook page, have had up there for weeks and weeks and weeks, a quote from Letters to a Young Contrarian by Hitchens that says, never be a spectator of unfairness or stupidity. Seek out argument and disputation for their own sake. The grave will supply plenty of time for silence. Absolutely. People will often say, why, don't, why do you have to stir the pot? Why, do you, why can't you just, just go with it? Why can't you make peace? Why can't you just respect everybody, no matter where they are, no matter how they are? Why do you have to be such an activist? What's your problem? And I'll, I will say outright that I, I don't want to be a spectator of unfairness or stupidity. The grave will supply plenty of time for silence. That's motivation for me. It's motivation for me to just get up and say something. I know we're all continuing to watch the headlines as the horrors of Boston start to become hopefully a little clearer. I'm amazed at how little we know. You know, I can't tell if it's the fault of law enforcement or the ham-handed attempts of the media to try to draw conclusions and getting them wrong. I mean, we're watching, trying to find out what motivated them, what it looks like. It looks like jihad. It looks like religion. Well, who are they tied in with? We're still, we're still groping. We're still grasping, trying to find the puzzle pieces. And you know, Boston and this country continues to be shaken to our core. And I posted something. I was on the road that day. I was driving to St. Louis for a uh, book tour stop. 
and we did a live uh, podcast actually there with the, the group. But I, I got the message as I was driving. So as soon as I got to the hotel, I felt like I should say something, right? I felt like, I, what would I want to hear? What do I feel? What do I think about all of this chaos? People are mourning. People are grieving. People are terrified. People are, they feel absolutely vulnerable and afraid and fragile. And so I posted this and I thought it might be appropriate. I thought these are the words I'd like to leave you with today, if I may. It said, we look at the horrors of Boston and we're again shaken to our core. Throughout our history, there have always been monsters among us. Their terrible deeds searing us with confusion and pain. They've peppered our history books and our headlines with terrible acts done for terrible reasons, and they will always be here. But I will not give them this day. I give today to those who could have run from the chaotic scene, but instead broke through barriers and rushed to the sides of total strangers in pain. I give today to the paramedics, the police, firefighters, and physicians who worked to heal what another had so horribly hurt. I give today to the communities, both physical and online, working to find avenues that might provide financial and emotional support to the wounded and grieving. I give today to the best of us. It's a terrible day, but when I look at humankind... I will not define it by the anonymous cowards, then anonymous cowards bent on destruction and chaos. I will define it by so many more who demonstrated something beautiful in the face of so much ugliness. To the good, the compassionate, the brave, the helpful, the kind, the loving, and the generous, I give the day to you. And that's exactly how I feel. When the worst happened, human beings were there for each other. When the unbelievable grief threatens to just suffocate us, human beings will be there for each other. And as they look to the sky and call down favors and, and, and comfort from the heavens, human beings will always be there for each other. And I'll tell you, I would take a human touch, a human voice. I would take someone who cared about me in the room during the darkest time in my life. I would take a human encounter any day, any moment, over a supernatural one. Thank you so much for listening to the show tonight. I hope it provided some encouragement for you. Next week, we're doing a show called Science is Just Awesome. We're going to talk about some of the coolest stuff, some of the most amazing and groundbreaking stuff, the most life-changing stuff that science has brought to us here in this modern age. And we're going to have a lot of fun. I will see you next week on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Take care. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com